Hello. 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 Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Did you lose me or, or um uh yeah, I didn't hear anything. Okay. This episode of Trifles is made possible by listeners like you who support us on Patreon and Substack. To learn more, go to patreon.com slash trifles or trifles.substack.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the circle was red, the study was scarlet, and the scot was glorious, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutiae? Have you ever stopped to wonder about the giant rat of Sumatra, the remarkable worm unknown to science, or the repulsive story of the red leech? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 380, To Go to Norwood. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we get into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, are you ready to go to Norwood? I am so ready to go to Norwood. I've packed my toothbrush and my extra socks, and oh. I'm carrying my umbrella just in case. I love it. I love it. Well, that and your Ely's number two are all I think we should need. <laughs> I have two Ely's number ones. I couldn't find my, oh, my well, Ely's number two. If you hold them together and then wrap a rubber band <laughs> around the, uh, the nozzle... Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. That's a good idea. It's better than what I did with my socks, which folded. I folded them up in the umbrella. And I thought that was so clever when I thought of the idea, but it makes the umbrella pretty lumpy. And if it starts to rain, of course, I'm going to lose my socks. So what was I thinking? And now we know what happened to James Fillimore. <laughs> he had to go back in to get a, a change of socks. Oh, of course. <laughs> and his umbrella. Oh, of course. I never thought of that. <laughs> well, we are here to talk neither about umbrellas nor socks, but this is our monthly travel series that we're doing here on Trifles in Season 8. We pick some kind of inspiration from the canon or from uh, canonical scholarship uh, that references Holmes and Watson traveling around uh, the London suburbs and countryside. And in this case, we are venturing to go to oh my gosh you guessed it norwood this was inspired by a scene in the sign of four and we thought we would explore that with you with the help of none other than michael harrison we'll have links in the show notes which you can find at sherlockholmespodcast.com that's our website you can visit there to sign up for email updates and to join us as a Patreon supporter, or if Substack is more your thing, we do have a presence on Substack as well. You can find us there at trifles.substack.com. Uh, you can join as a paid or free supporter there, but when you join via Patreon, there are uh, thank you gifts at certain levels. And when you are a member, a supporting member, you do get the bonus content as well as being entered into a drawing automatically at the end of every month for a free back issue of the Baker Street Journal. So check that out and see what works for you. Okay, so we find ourselves heading toward Norwood. But this, this journey, interestingly enough, in the sign of four begins at a location that I think has a very personal meaning to you, Bert. <laughs> Well, it begins at the Lyceum Theater, because what's happened here, of course, is that Mary Morstan has gone to Holmes and Watson with the puzzle of these pearls, and now she's received uh, a note that uh, tells her that she's been a wronged woman, but all will be explained to her if she, if she goes to the third pillar from the left at the Lyceum Theater. Bring two friends, and son of a gun, Holmes and Watson are just those two people. Mm. 
And, and just, I was but, just for our audience, you in the in the Baker Street Irregulars received the investiture, the third pillar from the left. I did, I did, because I was writing plays for the Cornish R as a whole series of plays in the early years, well, in my early years with the uh, Scion Society, all just one-act comedies that were a lot of fun to do. How fun. Well, it uh, when they do get to uh, the Lyceum Theater and they, they meet up with Mary Morstan, uh, they're greeted by another party, from what I recall. Um, there was uh, a small, dark, brisk man in the dress of a coachman who accosted them, asking if they were the parties who came with Miss Morstan. Uh, and she identified herself, and um, he gave a shrill whistle on which a street Arab led across a four-wheeler and opened the door. And uh, he mounted the box, and the rest of them took their place inside. He whipped up the horse, and they were plunged away at a furious pace through the foggy streets of London, driving to an unknown place. Now, this is interesting because this doesn't take them to Pondicherry Lodge, which, of course, is the... You know, the big on-location scene that everyone thinks of from the sign of four. This takes them instead um, on a remarkable journey across London. Yeah, Watson says, at first I had some ideas to the, the uh, direction which we were driving. Uh, but he said, soon the fog and my limited knowledge of London, uh, lost. Uh, I lost my bearings. Uh, Sherlock Holmes was never at fault, however, and he muttered the names as the cab rattled through the squares in and out and uh, uh, by torturous by streets. Rochester Row, now Vincent Square. Now we come to the Vauxhall Bridge Road. We're making for the Surrey side, apparently. <laughs> yes, I thought so. Now we're on the bridge. You can catch glimpses of the river. It's a wonderful scene. You know, Holmes does this conjuring in his mind as he mentally follows the cab along the streets. And it's a wonderful thing to see his his brain in action. And, you know, also the descriptions, Watson's descriptions are great. We, in, we in, did indeed, indeed get a fleeting view of a stretch of the Thames with the lamps shining upon the broad, silent water. But our cab dashed on and was soon involved in a labyrinth of streets upon the upper side. Words with road, said my companion. Priory Road, Lark Hall Lane, Stockwell Place, Robert Street, Cold Harbor Lane. Our quest does not appear to take us to very fashionable regions. <laughs> <laughs> now recall, uh, I think it was in the Red-Headed League, Holmes stated... It is my hobby to have an exact knowledge of London. Mm. And th this is almost the encyclopedic knowledge that a cabbie would have. You know, of course, in, in London, uh, London cab drivers infamously have to take a test called the knowledge, uh, where, where they effectively have to be uh, as, as knowledgeable as uh, the GPS on your phone. Mm. And uh, they, you give them a street, you give them even a hotel name, and they know exactly where it is, how to get there, etc. So Holmes would seem to have, uh, he could have served well as a cabbie. And, and I, maybe really? he did at some point, you know, yeah. as he was uh, getting his bearings for London. I'm sure someone must have written about that suggestion that as he was looking for money after he first came to London to, as his practice was getting off the ground, he made... Hmm. <laughs> been that's part, actually that's -time really candy. interesting you know as a young mm. university student or you know as he was spending some time in and around mm. uh you know uh, muse the museum and that neighborhood he could have very well supplemented his income by doing just that and giving himself some knowledge about london and we know Mycroft. maybe he did that with his brother because we know mycroft from the final problem uh, also has the skills required to mm. be a coachman. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> well, uh, Watson continues saying uh, in, in the sign of four, we reached a questionable and forbidding neighborhood. Long lines of dull brick houses were only relieved by the coarse glare and tawdry brilliancy of the public houses across the corner. And then came rows of two-storied villas, 
each with a fronting of miniature garden, then with interminable lines of a new staring brick buildings, the monster tentacles which the giant city was throwing out into the country. At last, the cab drew up at the third house in a new terrace. None of the other houses were inhabited, and that at which we stopped was as dark as its neighbor, save for a single glimmer in the kitchen window. And that's when they entered to find uh, Mr. Taddeus Sholto. <laughs> yes. Well, and that's just a step on the way to our destination here. Uh, because we are off pretty soon after Thaddeus tells us the story and the sad story of the death of Mary Morstan's father mm. and the great value, the, the enormous wealth in the Agra treasure that could be awaiting her. And so, um, you know, we are... Uh, Thaddeus has to bundle up, of course, because his health is somewhat fragile. And <laughs> In professional is, hypochondriac, yes, right? Yes, yes. And uh, on, that, on that journey to Upper Norwood, where we're going to be arriving at Pondicherry Lodge, Thaddeus, you know, just talks incessantly and fills in all the details of the discovery of the treasure. And finally, Watson says, I was relieved when our cab pulled up with a jerk and the coachman sprang down to open the door. This, Miss Morstan, said Mr. Thaddeus Sholto, is Pondicherry Lodge. <laughs> ah, lovely. And that was uh, about 11 o'clock. Mm. They, uh, they alighted. Now, they had met, what time had they met at the Lyceum Theater? Oh, my... Well, I, my mem- I have to go back and look. My memory seven, is it was 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. So they go from the Lyceum Theater to this uh, unfashionable neighborhood on the Surrey side of London. Um, they hear some of Thaddeus's story. Uh, he regales them with the rest of it in the carriage on the way out to Norwood, and they arrive by 11. So... Um, you know, geographically speaking, when we think about Upper Norwood, this is south of London. It's still part of the London suburbs, um, but it would have taken them a good amount of time to get to uh, Upper Norwood from the Lyceum Theater. Hmm. If we actually wanted to map it from, and and not knowing exactly where uh, Pondicherry Lodge was. Uh, but if we wanted to map uh, Lyceum Theater to Upper Norwood, um, if you were to go by car mm. in the modern times, a straight shot, it looks like uh, the about eight miles. Eight miles would take you about forty-five minutes. Um, so you know, thinking in terms of a carriage ride, you know, we're probably talking a good two-hour ride or so mm. uh, from the Lyceum, uh, which is north of uh, the Thames. Um, well, actually, we, we wouldn't be going from uh, Lyceum, would we? We'd be going from the Surrey side. So mm. it would be a little shorter. But, you know, we're talking about a good hour and a half, two-hour ride to get to Upper Norwood. Yes. Yeah. We don't know precisically where Thaddeus is. Uh... Right. But we do, know, we do know some other things about Upper Norwood, thanks to our friend Michael Harrison. Yes. Yeah, Michael wrote about this and many other things in his 1960 book, In the Footsteps of Sherlock Holmes, and pointed out, among other things, that um, this particular suburb, this curiously rural suburb of Norbury, which merges imperceptibly into Crystal Palace and Norwood, Upper and Lower Norwood, as well as other towns, had its origin in the same sort of waters, spa waters, wells, sacred or medicinal, that were popular in other places, too. And although the neighborhood has changed a great deal over the years, one thing that remains from its past is its trees. And, of course, one of the great features of of Norwood, this particular area of London, 
was the proximity to the Crystal Palace. Hmm. But Michael points out that although the neighborhood has changed a great deal, one thing that remains, at least as he's writing in the 19, late 1950s, were the trees. A photo taken from an airplane flying over the Crystal Palace district shows that the district is still thickly wooded. Every road has its trees, every house has a garden, back and in front. And the Crystal Palace is a fascinating structure. It was built in 1851 in Hyde Park, and it was neither crystal nor a palace. (laughs) But it was transferred uh, to a site on Sydenham Hill and uh, re-erected and opened by the Queen in 1854 and points out how incredible it was in the neighborhood over almost 2,000 feet long, exclusive of wings and colonnades, 10,000 tons of cast iron, 25 acres of glass. There'd been nothing like it before. Hmm. Uh, Two great towers had been uh, added to the original structure, each 282 feet high, which dominated the London scene, much as the Eiffel Tower dominated the Parisian landscape. For just over 80 years, those tall gray towers jutted into the gray London sky. And through the and though the upkeep and cleaning of the Crystal Palace called for an expenditure, even in its early days, of 60,000 pounds a year, um, only for a few minutes at rare intervals did its twin towers and the vast hump of the palace itself show up as anything but a gray hugeness above the slate roofs and treetops of the mm. capital. Really lovely. Nice well, and the, and the district is, has developed in an odd way. It's on a st- steep hill, and um, a series of municipalities developed. Um, but Michael pointed out city merchants and retired army officers such as the dishonestly greedy Major Sholto, late of the 34th Bombay Infantry, (laughs) uh, preferred the neighborhood and were delighted by its ambience. I bet it was a select district. Yeah. It it, it was then, it still is today. And interestingly, uh, uh, as Harrison continues on, he says, so much bombing has taken place that the character of these dingier suburbs is being radically altered. Great blocks of municipal flats are going up, the insulae of London, and the old terraces, both of shops and houses, are disappearing. You know, we have, this is, this is somewhat uh, reminiscent of hearing uh, Watson talk about the tentacles uh, stretching out into the suburbs as development, even in the uh, 1880s uh, continued from the city to uh, suburbia. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, because this this particular journey, you know, we've been in two cab rides, you know, we've uh, traveled around London out to uh, a visit with Thaddeus, and, you know, now we're out in the suburbs here, and even in the days of Holmes and Watson and in the decades long before Michael was writing, these neighborhoods were changing. Um, He observed that even when he was writing, many private estates were still preserved as open spaces, Crystal Palace Park. So some of the rural aspect of the district that Holmes and Watson knew has still been preserved. But... um, you know, and he was generally optimistic, pointing out that um, people are starting to realize that w- an open space once lost is pretty well lost forever. Mm. And that could s- cause urban development to be slowed down somewhat in parts of London like this. Yeah, and if you, if you happen to type Upper Norwood into Google Maps... Uh, you'll see that it places you down uh, in Crystal Palace, uh, which is a region there, 
which is adjacent to Crystal Palace Park. And the original Crystal Palace, the one that you mentioned, had been moved from the Great Exhibition, uh, had been moved to this location. And, and the grounds, the park on which it stood, are still preserved. So there's a wonderful green space there with some water and you know, lots of uh, pathways and you know, just wonderful open area. The Crystal Palace Sphinxes are still there. The Crystal Palace Museum is there. Uh, the building itself having been burned down in 1936. Um, and, and I suppose, <laughs> unfortunately, when you say Crystal Palace to many people unfamiliar with the geography of that neighborhood, they just think immediately of the football club. <laughs> Which, yeah. you know, being in 14th place in the Premier League right now is not necessarily inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a magnificent district, and it's it's been it's been a lot of fun. I'm sure Norwood is a place we're going to be coming back to mm -hmm. in future episodes. After all, Conan Doyle lived at 12 Tennyson Road in South Norwood, and then we have the Norwood Builder. And when you look at the cases of Sherlock Holmes, it turns out Norwood just pops up in all sorts of unusual places. It is and it pops up at all sorts of unusual cases, rather. Indeed, and uh, I'm sure we will coming. We will be coming back to Norwood, and that will be anything but a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Well, it must take some time. Before we have to go to Norwood to see Brother Bartholomew. If we are to go to Norwood, it would perhaps be as well if we were to start at once. No. No, that would hardly do.